The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. Rabbi Yitzchak Vachnin and his wife, Rabbi Masuda Vachnin, both of whom were born and raised in Morocco, were the spiritual leaders of a Sephardic community in Malot, Israel. During the early years of their 65-year marriage, Rav Yitzchak served as the principal of a girls' seminary, and his wife helped along in the seminary. One day they learned that one of their students, her name was Mazal, was engaged to a wonderful boy named Hanan, and the entire school celebrated the occasion. Now, among Sephardic Jews, or those that took the debate, there's differences in tradition. There was a, there's a widely followed custom that the Shabbat after the wedding is called the Shabbat Chatan Vekala. It's a big celebration. Everyone comes together for the celebration of the first Shabbat of the newly married couple. Unfortunately, this young couple, Hanan, was from an orphan. It was from, he was an orphan, so he was from an impoverished family. And Mazal's family also were not better off. And so it was decided we had the money to make a wedding, but we do not have the money for the Shabbat Chatan Vakala. When Rebetzin Vachnin heard about this, she was very upset. How could a newlywed couple not have a memorable Shabbos to celebrate their union? And so she let them know, there will be a Shabbat Chatan, there will be the celebration. I'm handling it. I'm hosting it. Tell your family to come. It will happen. And she went about making her phone calls, having people volunteer, baking, cooking, raising money, getting a haul together. She did it all so that the Chatan and Kala would have this beautiful Shabbat experience like all other Chatan and Kalas have in their community. No expense was, she- was spared. Throughout the entire Shabbos, Mazel was beyond overwhelmed. This was so beautiful that all this was being done for them. And this, they were so close to not having this at all. And look at the beauty of people and the chesed and the kindness, especially of, of the Rebetzin. And she resolved at that point in her life that one day she was going to pay this forward. She was going to do this for someone else that didn't have the money to sponsor this. Decades passed. Hanan and Mazal built a large, beautiful family of their own. All in time, they kept in touch with the Rebetzin, never forgetting her kindness. And as for paying it forward, well, Mazal Sabag did much more than that. It didn't just become a one-time project. It became a life long project. She let it be known in all Sephardi communities, if you ever have a poor couple that can't support and can't sponsor the Shabbat Chatan Vakala, you let me know. I will raise the funds. I will host it. I will do it. And she became known in the Sephardi community of doing this dozens and dozens of dozens of times, all because some Rebetzin did this for her. When Rebetzin Vachnin passed away, Mazel, now an older woman herself, came to the shiva to comfort the family. And this is what she said to them. Over the years, I have had the schus, the privilege, to cook hundreds of meals for the Shabbat Chatan of poor and orphan newlyweds who had nowhere else to turn. I want you to imagine this scene when the Rebetzin went up to heaven. They would have shown her all these magnificent events that she had orchestrated, to which she would say, it's got to be a mistake. I only did this once. You're showing me pictures of places and things. I have no idea who or where and what. I had nothing to do with that. 67 years ago, I organized one for a couple. And at that point, the truth would have been revealed that that one Shabbat led to all of these, saving so many young couples from sadness and embarrassment. One mitzvah, one thoughtful deed, and there's no telling where it all leads. You see, my friends, I think we need to tweak our understanding of what being relevant means, of what it means to be significant. We don't have to perform some grand gesture on the world stage to matter. Even the smallest, most discreet of acts become the stuff of legends. Speaking of Israeli weddings, there was this one bright summer day in Jerusalem. A young bride is walking with her mother towards her chuppah, and she's holding this small, colorful umbrella over their heads. Now, it wasn't raining, so everyone there is thinking it must be some tradition in some other group. Maybe the Sephardim thought it belonged to the Ashkenazi custom, the Ashkenazim thought it belonged to the Sephardim, Europeans thought it was an Israeli custom. There's got to be some reason the Kala is walking down holding an umbrella when it's not raining. Maybe the sun is too bright. 
The truth is, there is no such tradition written of a kala walking to a chuppah holding a small, colorful umbrella. And during the wedding, the kala asked to speak. And she said, many of you are wondering, why did I walk with an umbrella to my chuppah? Some 13 years earlier, it was a cold and rainy day in Brooklyn. More than just raining, it was a heavy downpour. This little girl is holding a tiny, colorful umbrella, and she's standing patiently in front of 770 Eastern Parkway, Chabad's world headquarters. She's waiting, she's hoping to catch a glimpse of the Lubavitcher Rebbe as he arrives for prayers. This is something we kids did growing up in Crown Heights. If we were around at the time that the Rebbe's car would pull up, we would love to be there, because perhaps we would get a glimpse of the Rebbe. The Rebbe would smile to us, it would mean the world to us. So this kid is waiting out there, and it's a pouring, raining day, so she's got her umbrella. She's waiting all by herself because there's no other customers that day. And soon enough, the Rebbe's car pulls up. The Rebbe leaps from the back door, comes out. The Rebbe didn't have an umbrella with him and was hurrying to the door. And he notices this little girl waiting to greet him. So the Rebbe stops in the rain to smile at the little girl and looks at her warmly. And as he turned to continue towards the synagogue, this innocent child offers the Rebbe to shear her umbrella. Sweet and cute. The Rebbe walks over and bends under this little girl's umbrella and walked all the way to the door of 770 under this little girl's umbrella as the girl held the umbrella over the Rebbe's head. When they came to the building, the Rebbe held the door open for the little girl, smiled broadly and said, thank you for sharing. It was underneath that same umbrella which witnessed such a, such a sensitive act, small in size, but huge in heart and symbolism, that this bride, she says, the Rebbe's former umbrella carrier, chose to begin the new chapter of my life. That he cared so much about the sensitivity of a child, walking just those few feet, it changed my entire life. And so when I'm walking to my chuppah, I wanted to remember that moment. You see, often rain and gloominess washes away our spirit. We're often in a hurry to find refuge and safety for ourselves that we oblivious to those waiting to be greeted and seen by us. We often pass small moments that can transform the lives of others due to many pressing issues in our own lives. But to the Rebbe, no act of kindness was too small, no moment was too trivial, and no person was too insignificant. Earlier in the retreat, the first days, Rabbi Mordechai Farkash was here, and he shared the following story with me a while back. I met a Jew from Jerusalem who owned a business. The business fell on hard times, and he found himself in debt to many people, including some pretty bad actors who made his life miserable. With nonstop threats and harassment, his life became a living hell. And after years of suffering, he decided he can't take it anymore. He's going to do the unthinkable. He's going to bring an end to this misery once and for all. His plan was after leaving the house that day and making believe he was going to work, he would head to a bridge on the outskirts of Jerusalem. One can easily go off that bridge, hurtle down into a cliff, into the abyss, and in a matter of seconds, it would all be over. So he's leaving his house, and he says his final goodbye to his wife. She doesn't know what his thoughts are that day. He's heading to his car, and she calls him out by name and says, Wait, wait, you're going to work? Do me a favor. I prepared a package for our son. Could you please drop this package off at Yeshiva on your way to work? The teenage son was a student at the Ch- Ch- Chebner Yeshiva, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, in Jerusalem. He slept in the dorm during the week, so apparently the boy needed some items, told his mother. His mother put together a package. This is a problem because his plan was to go off in the bridge and the trip and the yeshiva was on the other side of town. But, all right, you know, the last thing I do in my life is a favor for my son. It's not the end of the world, so to speak. I can kill myself on the way back. I'll live another couple of hours. Ah, it's not the end of the world. He takes the bag and he gets into his car. He goes to the yeshiva. He walks into the building. He enters the hallway. And just then, one of the mashpias, the spiritual teachers and guidance counselors of the yeshiva, is exiting the study hall. So he says to the mashpia, would you possibly know where such and such student is? Can you ask him to come out? I have a package from him from his mother. The mashpia says he's in the middle of learning right now, so I don't think it's a good idea to disturb him. Leave it with me, and I'll give it to him later. So he says, okay, fine. Now, at first, the mashpia thought that perhaps this man was a taxi driver or a delivery boy. He said, I have a package from his mother. 
So he says, are, are you related to this boy? He says, I'm his father. You're his father? Wow. Tell me something. What schus, what merit do you have that God would give you such a boy, such a gem? Your son is a diamond, a mensch with a heart of gold, such a phenomenal head on the shoulders, a precious soul, so lovable, such a source of light and sensitivity. We love every moment that he's in this yeshiva. It's a privilege to have him here. So I want to know, what did you do to have such a son? The man goes back to his car and thinks to himself, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to commit suicide because I'm in debt a few million shekels. I have a phenomenal son. I'm going to take his father away from him forever, turn him into an orphan by choice? For what? Because of money? I have a wonderful wife. I have a family. Am I crazy? And he knocks some sense into himself. He went to work. He came home. He ended up moving out of Israel. He moved to the United States. He got a good career. Over time, he paid off all of his debt, and he's now connected to the Chabad community in Washington State. And he shared this story with Rabbi Farkash. Think one compliment. You don't know what those compliments do. Are we so stingy on our words? What does it really take to say a few kind words to someone? To give a warm compliment? To know how much a teacher may mean to your child? To tell that teacher that? Or the opposite way? For a teacher to tell a parent something good about their student? And to tell any child something good about themselves? Words that come from the heart enter the heart. And we can impact a person's life of those around us. We can affect the course of generations. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.